This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Uh, thanks very much and thanks all of you for coming. It's uh, wonderful to be here and talk to such a, um, an incredible audience. Um, I thought I'd start off by um, posing a question that I think is particularly relevant to all of us thinking about uh, language evolution. And that's what's so special about language. Um, in a sense, the goal of uh, evolutionary linguistics is to try and explain the origins of the special properties of language. Um, and there are two that I want to focus on today. In fact, uh, Roger started with one of them. So first off, I want to uh, highlight structure. Um, so language has a highly unusual and rich systematic structure in the way it's put together. So when I say uh, the phrase two boots, um, you are able to relate the acoustic waveform that hits your ears um, to this rather cute picture of my son's shoes on this slide. Now, how are you able to do that? Well, you're able to do that because of the special structure that language has. The signals that we produce are constructed of sequences of these meaningless elements. Um, we call them phonemes. Um, so these uh, different phonemes are put together in different, different ways, reorganized in different ways to make up the sounds of our language in sequences. Um, but furthermore, these meaningless elements are themselves put together to make morphemes, the meaning-carrying elements of language. And these are put together to construct meaningful wholes. So you understand what two boots means because you understand these ways in which uh, language recombines elements. Um, and it's because of this recombination, because we can endlessly recombine elements at these two different levels, that we are able to talk about anything. So we're able to constantly be producing completely new utterances with the happy expectation that everyone can understand us. And this is an incredible feat. And uh, remarkably, it seems to be unique to our species. OK, so that was one of the uh, special features of language structure. So next up, the other one I want to talk about is learning. So the we are able to use language because we have learned how, both how to produce the signals in our language, 
And we've also learned, perhaps even more remarkably, what the signals in our language mean. So we're able to use language meaningfully because we've observed language being used around us as we, as we grow up. Um, again, this, this combination of learning the signals and learning the meaning seems to be unique in nature. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is that the fact that this is a very particular kind of learning. Um, when we learn language, we're learning from the product of other people who have gone through the same learning process. Uh, so we, we learn from the observation of the output of other learners. So this is something that I call iterated learning. And it's a particular um, and, and relatively unusual process in nature. So what iterated learning means is that the, the language I, I speak, I learned um, by observing language being produced by my parents. And the language I produce is going on to affect the language um, that my son and daughter are acquiring. And so what this means is that we have this um, process of cultural transmission of language through this mapping from um, external uh, production of uh, language and an internal, some internal representation of language. And what this means is that languages evolve. So this is a kind of cultural evolution. So languages, language itself is a, uh, an evolutionary system in its own right. And what I want to suggest today that these two features, structure and iterated learning, are related to each other. Um, that, and in fact, what I want to claim is that language structure is the inevitable consequence of the fact that language is a culturally evolving system. So I want to uh, try and uh, pose and answer this question um, affirmatively that uh, cultural evolution can explain why language has the structure that it does. So how on earth could we go about answering this question? So this is one of the challenges of doing evolutionary linguistics is how on earth do you study it scientifically? Well, there are lots of ways, and you're going to hear about a lot of them today. Um, but one of the ways that um, we pioneered in my lab in Edinburgh was to try and recreate language evolution, the cultural evolution of language, in the experiment lab. So I'm going to show you how we do that. I'm going to give you two examples of two experiments that we've done that will give you a flavor of the way in which we can study uh, cultural evolution of language in the lab. So generally, how do we do this? So what we did is we brought together two, two kind of standard experimental techniques from two different areas. Um, one was uh, a paradigm from psycholinguistics called artificial language learning, where we get participants to, into the lab and teach them miniature languages and then test them. And another technique um, from um, experimental anthropology, I guess you'd call it, um, called a transmission chain paradigm. And this is a way people study um, the process of cultural evolution in various different domains. So we're just plugging those two together. So I'll talk you through in, in general how it works, and then I'll give you the um, two specific examples. So first off, we bring a participant into the lab, and we ask them to learn a miniature language. And so this is a, like a very, very uh, small miniature artificial language that we've created. So we might have them in the lab for an hour maximum. And then we test them. So we get them to produce utterances in this um, uh, miniature language. So at this stage, this is a standard paradigm, artificial language learning paradigm. But the twist we put on it is that we use the output of that participant when we test them to form the language that the next participant in the lab is going to learn from. And then we take the output of that second participant and use that to form the input training data for the third participant in the lab, and so on. So we create a chain of transmission of this miniature language and watch how it evolves as it passes from participant to participant in our experiments. And what we typically do is we start with a language, in scare quotes, that is random and unstructured and doesn't have these structural properties that we're interested in. And then we want to see if those structural properties emerge through this process of transmission over these artificial generations that we create in, in the lab experiments. OK, so that's the general structure of these, these exp this experimental approach. And I'm going to give you two examples. So here's the first example, and this is uh, joint work with Hannah Cornish and Kenny Smith, pictured there. Um, 
And this was, this was our first experiment, the first experiment we did in our lab. Um, and so this is, as you can see, 2008. It's a relatively recent um, approach that we've been taking here. And what we wanted to do is look for this emergence of compositional structure. So compositional structure is the idea that um, you can put words together to make meanings. So the meaning of a whole expression is made up of the meanings of parts of that expression. So we wanted to see if we could get that to emerge in, uh, in these lab experiments. Okay, so uh, what participants did, so we have this kind of experimental chain of participants. And what the participants were asked to do was learn a miniature language. And the language was made up of these weird meanings, which were just colored shapes that were moving in different ways. And we had three colors, um, three shapes, and three different types of movement. So three times three times three, that makes 27 different possible meanings in this language. So when I say miniature language, I really mean miniature. OK, and these uh, pictures, these um, meanings were paired with strings of syllables. And these were just made up at random by the computer. OK, so this is completely unstructured, arbitrary language. Every single meaning was given a different label. And each uh, participant was trained on uh, half of the language, um, but then was tested on all of the meanings. So they were, they were trained on half of, all of the, half of the meanings, but then were asked to produce um, uh, strings of syllables for all of the meanings when we tested them. And then their output then formed the input to the next participant in the lab. And again, we took a random half of the output of the first participant to train the second one, and then test the second one, and take another random half of their language to train the third participant, and so on down the chain. Okay? So what happens? Well, what we find is that the people are absolutely terrible at this task. So, um, so the, this graph shows uh, error, um, and it's a rather forgiving measure of error. It just said, uh, an error of one meant would mean that you got not a single character, not a single letter right in the target word. An error of zero means you get everything right. So, and what you see here is four different runs of the experiment, and each uh, point on this graph is a different participant, okay? So, the first participants in the lab had a really terrible time. In fact, nobody got a single word exactly right. So it's essentially absolutely awful. <laughs> By the end, however, the uh, participants in the, in the later generations in these chains, some of them were getting everything exactly right, including the meanings that they weren't trained on. So they were successfully guessing the correct label for meanings that we didn't even test that they train them on. Okay, so how on earth is that happening? Well, I'll show you what the languages look like as they evolve. So here's, here's a, an initial random language. So for example, in this um, table, the word mini key is the word for a blue square that's moving horizontally. Um, now, bear in mind, if you're trained on half of this language, imagine if I blanked out half of these words, and then I asked you to reconstruct the missing words, that you'd have no hope. You couldn't possibly get it right, OK, because this is random. So if you didn't know that that word was mini-key, there's no way you could guess it. So that's why they're doing so badly. And this is what it, that same language looks like uh, 10 generations later. Right. So now you see how the participants are doing this, right? So now if I blanked off half of those words, you'd be able to successfully guess what the missing words were. For example, the word poi now refers to all spiraling objects. So this language has evolved to become more easy to learn, but it's evolved in a very, very kind of slightly disappointing way from our point of view. Uh, so it's, it's evolved just by jettisoning words um, in a particular way so that these words refer to, to particular sort of sections of the set of meanings. So why was this happening? In fact, in some versions of the experiment, we'd go down to a single word for all, the, all things. <laughs> so clearly, we need something else um, in this experiment. So we need some kind of pressure to be expressive as well as learnable for the language. Um, I can't go into the details, so I don't have time. But what we essentially did was we added in a, a filter on the output of each participant um, so we threw out items that were ambiguous before we passed it on to the next participant. And none of the participants could be aware that we were doing this manipulation. 
So, this is a, so we ran the whole experiment again with this extra step, hidden step, and we got um, completely different results. So here's again the initial and another initial language, again completely random. And now, and now, 10 generations later, it looks quite different. Now what I've done here is I've added in hyphens to make it easier for you to see, but the participants don't get to see these hyphens, right? And what you see here is that um, different parts of the uh, uh, signals correspond to different parts of the meanings. So for example, this N uh, prefix means uh, the black things. The R prefix means red things. Um, a plo suffix means something that's bouncing, and so on. So this is the compositionality we were looking for. And it emerged out of this process of cultural transmission. So structure seems to emerge spontaneously from this process of cultural evolution. Now, there's a couple of obvious um, worries that you might have. So firstly, perhaps the participants in our experiment are kind of deliberately thinking, well, this, this language is rubbish. Um, here's how we can fix it up. We'll add some structure. Well, we don't think that's what's happening because uh, bear in mind these two different runs of the experiment got very different languages out, but the participants couldn't know which, which condition they were in. Another possible objection is, well, okay, but they already speak a language. In fact, all of our participants spoke English. So it's not surprising that they gradually um, change this system to, to be one that looks more like a language. Well, that's a, a valid worry. So we've recreated the, all of this experiment in computer simulation, and um, where we can know that our um, com computational participants don't have a pre-existing language, and we get the same results. OK, so that's my first example. But a second example, um, we wanted to move away from this um, starting point with these random strings, because that seems a bit weird. Where did they come from? And instead, we start from a potentially much more natural starting point, um, one of um, uh, gestural um, pantomime. And we wanted to see if we could evolve structured, something looked like a structured sign language, miniature structured sign language, out of an initial state that was iconic pantomime. And this is joint work with Kenny Smith, Katya Abramova, and Erica Cartmill. So how, here's how the experiment works. So in this version of the experiment, the meanings now are um, videos of a bouncing ball. So here's one. So that's, that's the things that have to be conveyed. And the signals are manual gestures made to a video camera. Um, so something like this. Um, and the initial language in this experiment was improvised one-off pantomimes that we got people into the lab and just said, OK, can you give a pantomime that corresponds to this video? Uh, participants were trained on 12 out of the 16 videos, um, but asked to produce gestures for all 16. And then the same process of this sort of diffusion chain, uh, transmission chain, um, um, was applied. So we'd see how the gestures evolved over generations. I'll just show you the full set of meanings. It's a little bit alarming when you see it. Uh, so these are all the different videos um, tiled together. And what you can see here is there's uh, uh, different paths in which the ball moves along, so flat, sloping, in an S shape, or in a circle. And there are different manners. So the ball might be bouncing, or rolling, or spinning, or giving this nightmarish jittering <laughs> motion. So that's the set of meanings they have to convey. And this is what the initial uh, pantomimes looked like for all the participants we got in just to do one-off uh, gesture for these. Um, and what you see here is there's a huge range of different strategies that people use to um, produce these meanings. There's enormous diversity in, in strategies here. So what we were interested in, yeah, some of them more successful than others. Um, what we were interested in is how do these strategies evolve down generations. So here's our first participant who saw 12 of these um, and then produced uh, a gesture for each of them. Um, now, it looks more systematic, but that's because it's one person, so they, they all look a little bit more similar. In fact, there's still a lot of diversity here. If you look at the hand shape to use to convey uh, the ball and so on, there's still a lot of diversity. Um, much later in the same chain, we have this participant. Now, um, it's looking much more uh, systematic. There is, um, there is, if you look at hand shape, for example, it's now um, very similar across all the different videos. 
And there's particular kinds of systematicity we were interested in. So here's, here's an example from another chain, which I particularly like. Um, and have a look at what she's doing here to convey the ball moving. So she signals the ball and then says the manner and then the path. So she separated out two aspects of this meaning compositionally into two different parts. And indeed, another interesting thing that she does here is she self-corrects. So she says, oh, no, I got it wrong. And watch again. She'll do it again. Um, and this indicates that at this point in this the evolution of the language, she's seeing that there's a right and wrong answer. It's become grammatical. OK, so just to summarize these, and then I'm, I'll be done. Um, so over time, the gestures in this language become less pantomimic and more conventional. Um, and we can actually measure this. Um, we can show that systematic structure emerges over generations in this experiment. And interestingly, this separation of manner and path mirrors what we can see in real emerging sign languages. So this is um, work by Annie Senghas and colleagues looking at how in Nicaraguan sign language and emerging sign language, we get this separation of manner and path emerging over generations, over cohorts. So just fi final conclusions. Um, I want to argue that language is an evolutionary system in its own right. And languages, because of this, languages adapt. And they adapt to pass more easily from learner to learner. And linguistic structure is the solution that cultural evolution finds to the problem of being learnable. So it's an inevitable consequence of the way language is transmitted. And we can, and indeed we should, study this process in the experiment lab. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. As speakers of English, when we hear constructions like get em, bring em, take em, we analyze those as a verb and a pronoun, get them or get him, bring them or bring him. This analysis is supported by the fact that we read and write. We rarely see the informal forms written. It's usually the formal forms. And through schooling, which generally tell us to use the formal forms and to leave the others alone. But we also know when it's appropriate to use which style uh, in which context. We're now going to move to a different context where speakers heard those constructions but analysed them differently. When Australia was colonised, there were about 250 languages spoken by Indigenous people. The speakers of the Australian languages and the English speakers had to learn to communicate with each other very quickly. Usually, the English speakers didn't learn much of the Australian languages. The onus was on the Indigenous people to learn as much English as they could to get by with. So let's imagine that the English speakers were using the informal constructions a lot when they were speaking. Take them over there, bring them back. Constructions like that that we use all the time without thinking about it. The speakers of the Australian languages who hadn't yet learned English identified a pattern in what they were hearing. When they heard verbs like get, bring, take, they frequently heard something like m mm occurring after the verb. But they didn't hear that when the verb was something like walk, which doesn't have a direct object. So they came to analyse the um that we would think of as a pronoun as being a grammatical element that attaches to a transitive verb. It's a verb with an object, but not to verbs like walk and run. They didn't have literacy or schooling to influence their analysis. They just made this analysis from identifying patterns in the language being spoken to them and what they heard around them. So the transitive um or the transitive marker is a new, a new structure that came into that system uh, that was not the same as a structure that was already in English, and it was not in the Australian languages either. But we can see where it came from. But the Australian languages did influence that structure in abstract ways. The form of im is clearly from English, but there are other influences from the Australian languages. I've just listed a few of them here. 
One is, for example, that in those languages, when you have a transitive verb construction, it's a different construction from an intransitive verb. So those speakers learn to pay attention to the transitivity of the verb in every clause because that was required by their grammar. So it made sense to them, based on their first languages, to have a different construction for a transitive versus an intransitive verb. In addition, there were rules for words and the sound systems within the language that the Australian verbs didn't suit very well uh, and the new analysis suited them better. So for example, words in Australian languages are often at least two syllables long. If you have a short verb, adding the transitive marker made it longer and conformed more to the rules of the first languages. Similarly, words in Australian languages in that area didn't usually end with a cluster of consonants at the end of the word. So again, adding that marker made the word shape conform more to the type of verb that speakers of those languages were used to. The im structure is a good example of some characteristics of a pidgin. The word forms come mostly from the language that was spoken by the socially dominant group, which we call the lexifier language. But a lot of the structure uh, and word meanings come from the other multiple languages that were being spoken by the creators. In addition, reanalyses take place, such as what we've just seen, through pattern finding processes and second language learning processes. A pidgin is a means of intergroup communication. You speak to, you, you use it to speak to people whose language you don't know. And all of those speakers were still using their own first languages when they spoke to people within their same group. The pidgin spread throughout Australia as English speakers thread, spread throughout Australia. And in each place, there were Australian languages and those speakers were contributing features to the new system. Indigenous people were brought together in groups and needed to interact with speakers of many other languages with whom traditionally they wouldn't have interacted much or at all. So they all needed a way to speak to each other. And this system was a good system to build on in order to do that. As speakers ne uh, needed to talk about more and more topics with each other, more and more elements were added from English and also from the Australian languages. Varieties of Northern Territory Creole were uh, derived from interactions of this kind. Here's an example. That mummy one and that beginning when I stop him in that development way that that to talk. And you can see there the transitive marker on the verb which came in via the pigeon. There's another interesting element there, which is been, meaning past tense. Again, the form is from English, have been, had been. But there's another reanalysis there, so it just means simple past tense. It's not part of the have been or had been construction. Research suggests that there's more than one developmental path for a Creole language, but this is one attested path. Again, the word forms come mostly from the socially dominant language, English, uh, but much of the structure and the word meanings come from the other input languages. In this case, there was an earlier pidgin that fed into the Creole. Reanalyses took place through pattern finding and second language learning processes, and the system expanded and developed. There was a pr uh, prior pidgin that was used for intergroup communication. A Creole is the first language of its speakers and is a full language. This variety of Creole uh, continued to develop and stabilise probably up until about the 1940s and 50s, and it currently has several varieties. We'll turn now to another kind of contact language in another setting in Australia. This is in a small Walpuri community in the Northern Territory. In this community, Speakers over about the age of 35 mostly speak Walpuri, their traditional language. But they also code switch into varieties of English and Creole. Code switching is switching between languages in a sim single conversation. And by Aboriginal English there, I mean English with elements of the indigenous languages and elements of Creole in it. 
Younger speakers, younger adults and children speak in a new way which systematically combines elements from those sources and which we call light Walpri. Children learn to speak this language from when they first begin to talk now. As they grow older, they also produce Walpri and they code switch into the, the English-based varieties. The children now learn light Walpri and Walpri from birth. We'll look at a little background structure of the contributing languages before we look at the structure of light Walpri. <laughs> Pota watil pungo kurongo jo chando jongo lakango kukongo. As you can see there, Walpri is a suffixing language. A lot of the grammatical functions are indicated through suffixes on words. We can also see here the difference between the transitive and intransitive construction that I mentioned earlier that the pigeon creators paid attention to. The word there for child who's doing the chasing and the monster who's doing the taking have a suffix on them that doesn't occur on nouns when there's a transitive, an intransitive verb like walk. So it's in that way that these constructions are quite different. And in contrast, varieties of English and Creole indicate grammatical functions mostly through separate words and with fairly fixed word order. So how do these languages combine in this new system, like Walpuri? You might notice that there are English verbs there, come and go. Much of the verb system of like Walpuri is from Aboriginal English and Creole verb structure, but not entirely. If you look at example three, there's actually a Walpri verb stem, but it has the Creole transitive marker on it. So the overall structure is uh, derived from those languages. You can see there the Walpri suffixing. So we have <coughs> the verbal structure mostly from Aboriginal English and Creole, but we have all of the, the noun structure retained from Walpri. But in the verbal structure, there are also innovations which are indicated in green, the weem and the yum. And they're what we're most interested in today. This pattern of verbal structure from one source and noun structure from another source is fairly unusual in the world's languages. The differences between Walpri and light Walpri are in the verb and auxiliary structure, which have these clearly different forms. But the underlying abstract structure is more complicated. So the weem and neum constructions, which are the innovations, are part of, part of an overall system, much of which already existed in Creole and Aboriginal English. You can see there that for each word, there's a pronoun element like we, you, are, which is from I, and then there's another element, which mostly means time. So where did this weem and neum construction come from? We know that it's not something that comes from English. Well, it seems that the m um came from English I'm, like the form, but there's also an m um in the Aboriginal English and Creole pronouns, im and dem. Through this process of creating this structure, they were reanalyzed so that instead of being a pronoun im or dem, uh, they were a new structure where they were divided into two parts. Now, Aboriginal English and Creole uh, has this past marker bin, and that rarely occurs in light Walpuri. So instead of using that, what has happened is that the speakers have taken the past meaning from bin and overlaid it on the m element uh, from English and Aboriginal English and Creole, such that they have this new structure where the m mm is a separate morpheme with, with its own meaning that means present or past or non-future. And then that is regularized across the system 
and you have a new paradigm. Another example. Why do not I get my card? Get a middle bed. Why am I doing that one? That was some kids playing a card game for me and using that structure there. So what are the influences on the new structure? Again, we see that the word shape or form comes from the varieties of English or Creole. But the structure and the meaning comes from multiple sources. In Walpri, the auxiliary has a structure where there's a, a time element, which is the cut there, meaning present, and a pronoun element. And you can see that all through the system, these are affixes. They're not separate words. So I think that this underlying structure of wanting a time element and a pronoun element affixed together was part of the influence that fed into the new system. In Walpri, the verb and the auxiliary forms combine in different kinds of constructions to give the same kinds of semantic readings as we find in light Walpri. So in the final column, those three meanings of non-future, future and desiderative or want to are exactly the categories that we find in light Walpri. But they're not structural categories in Walpri, they're semantic categories. And again, they've been overlaid onto the forms in light Walpri. So how did the whole language come to be? It was through a two-step process. When the adult groups who are now about 35 years old were children, I think that other adults spoke to them <coughs> in what is known as a baby talk register. And in that register, they code switched a lot. And they code switched in a particular pattern. So it would be something like this, where there would be a Walpri sentence, but they would insert a Creole pronoun and verb into that sentence. And that is the pattern that the children then conventionalized by analyzing it as a single system. At the same time, they added the innovations that we've just been talking about. That group of children, who I think did this maybe when they were three, four, or five, certainly before they were teenagers, they then grew up, had children of their own, and so now those children learn that language as one of their first languages, along with Walpri. And it's their primary language. So the path to this language is a little different. It's not, it wasn't created for intergroup communication. It was created within one group of people in one community, and it's only spoken within that group of people in that community. The speakers were multilingual. There was a lot of code switching. It was directed to children, very young children, in a particular pattern. They then conventionalized it and reanalyzed some of the input they were hearing and then regularized their analysis to create new paradigms. From English and Creole, we get words and a lot of verb structure. From Walpri, we get words, the noun structure, and also abstract verbal structure. And this new system is the first language of the current generations. So what we've been able to see almost in real time is a new language develop and an innovative structure in that language through a two-step process. Adults had fairly systematic code switching in the speech that they were directing to children. And then the children had a very creative role in conventionalizing that input and adding the innovations. The overall structure is unusual because it combines the noun structure from one type of language with the verb structure for another. And there are these innovations, which are interesting in that we can see exactly where they've come from. We can see exactly the reanalyses that have taken place. And we can see that at the end of that reanalysis, there is a new construction. Thank you. If you go to Nicaragua today, you can see these deaf children hanging out in their school playground using a rich natural sign language to communicate. And 40 years ago, this language didn't exist. 40 years ago, deaf children in Nicaragua, children just like these kids, 
didn't have the ability to communicate effortlessly with one another like they do. So how did their language, how did this language get into the hands of these children? Um, if we think about that, we have to really think about where does any language come from? Where does a language come from? Language is really central to human nature. It's, it's universal. Not every community has writing or numbers or even the wheel, but every community, every human community has a language. And language, it, it's not something that we've discovered out there in the world. It, they, languages come from us. They're product of humans connecting and interacting in a social network generation after generation. So to see where this language came from, I'm going to take you on a little journey and retrace the path of Nicaraguan Sign Language up to the present day. When these children arrived at school five years ago, uh, there were already about 1,200 deaf native users of Nicaraguan Sign Language. And, and there were hundreds of kids, older than them, uh, using this language around them in their school. And, and these children learned it from interacting with them. Now, if we want to know what those hundreds of kids who were older than that first, that current day generation of children, um, uh, what they looked like, we can look at the kids who were teenagers at the time when they entered. So this first group here um, entered the school in the mid-1990s. And at that time, there were about 800 signers of Nicaraguan Sign Language. And, um, 200 of them were at the school at any time. And, um, it, you know, you can see that this is, it's a fast, it's fluent, they can talk about the non here and now. This is a natural human language that's used for what human languages are used for. Um, and if we want to know where they got their language from, we can retrace the steps of the language further um, back when these kids were four and five years old. Um, and, and ask, you know, who were the teenagers then when they arrived at the school? And so we can look at the people who were, you know, 10 years older than them. Um, when these guys, uh, these are the, the cohort that arrived um, in the 1980s. So, um, when they arrived, there were about 400 signers of Nicaraguan Sign Language, again, 200 at the school. And, and you may be able, if you have an eye for it, you may be able to see how, as we're going further and further back, the language is a little bit more deliberate, um, the feedback is a little more explicit, and the signs are bigger and, and more symmetrical. There are more two-handed signs. There are lots of differences like that, and my, a lot of the work I do is to try and quantify what those differences are. But um, if you wanted to know, uh, you know who they got their language from, sort of to continue this um, retracing of the steps, uh, when they arrived at the school, the older people were these people who are um, 45 to 50 years old today. And when these people were four and five years old, in the 1970s, and they first came to the school, uh, there were no signers of Nicaraguan Sign Language. And, and, and this is where we reach sort of the end of our retracing. Nobody taught these people to sign. The teachers at the school used Spanish, which they couldn't hear. And, and so this is really where NSL begins with this cohort of 50 pioneers. They took the gestures and actions that they observed as their raw materials and wove them into a new language. So we have this incredible opportunity to see how languages are born and evolve and the role that language learners play in that evolution. And I'm going to start with the language of this earliest, first cohort of signers, and walk forward to the present day and start with the most fundamental pieces of the grammar that every language has, the structure of the simple statement. So arguments and predicates. Um, how do you show who's doing what to whom? So in English, for example, we use word order to do this. So if you take a sentence like, a man taps a woman, and you change the order of the words, a woman taps a man, you change who's doing the tapping and who gets tapped. Now, other languages might stick inflectional endings on the end of the verbs, or even on the nouns, to show which person is the tapper and which is the tappy. 
And to figure this out, my colleagues and I use, we use nonverbal materials to elicit sentences that can compare uh, these different aspects of the sentence. So I'll show you how different signers respond to stimuli like these. Um, so an event like this giving event or this tapping event. Um, and here's what the first cohort sentences look like. They have a very strict noun verb, noun verb word order. So to say that a woman taps a man, you've got woman tap and man tapped. And here's what this looks like when a first cohort signer signs it. So I want you to see how um, he produces that noun verb, noun verb order, first signing who tapped, and um, this sign for woman, which is produced like this. And who is tapped, um, his sign for man. Um, so he's going to sign these nouns, man and woman, and in a neutral area in front of his chest. And, and note that there's this movement in the verbs away from and toward the body in a way that can reflect sort of iconically the way that movement happens in the world. But they're centered in the signer's body. He keeps his body centered and neutral. And so um, here's what it looks like. Woman tap, man get tapped. Right? So this is all very nice and clear and orderly. But the interesting thing is that it wasn't reproduced this way in the next second cohort. So starting in about 1983 or 84, the second wave of kids who were coming in took this um, direction in which signs are produced and started giving that a job in the grammar. And what they did was start modifying where they produced their signs as a way of showing who did what to whom. So in this example in the first panel, we have the words um, see and pay produced in this neutral area in front of the chest. And in the second panel, you can see we've, the, the signs have been modified so the direction is to the left. So if these signs were together in one sentence, produced by a second cohort signer, um, it would mean that that uh, same person was both seen and paid. Right? The, so these inflections started out with verbs like this. But soon after, in the mid-80s, you can also start producing nouns in particular locations to link them to verbs. And more recently, you can even use it just a point to one location or another to refer to the person associated with that location. So now you're using these locations in space not to talk about where something happened, but to show who's involved. Um, so we'll see, here's an example of what a second cohort signer does. And you can see how these developments really changed the basic structure of the sentence, right? So um, here uh, is the woman giving to the man event. And you'll see we get the nouns now being produced in particular locations that correspond with the direction of movement in the verbs to show you what the object or recipient is. And, and notice that with the addition of uh, the spatial modification on the signs, there came in changes in the word order. So now the verbs move to the end of the sentence. So you're, you're going to see, first she actually talks about, remember there were three people in that, in that scene. So she starts talking about the woman on the right, just looking straight ahead. Then she touches her chest. That's a switch reference device. Um, and then you'll see she does woman, man, your nouns, and then give, receive, your verbs. woman look, and then self woman, man, give, receive. OK? And now, if we move to the third cohort, we're going to see the introduction of the space all you so use with points, linking the verbs with the doer and the done to. So this is an event where um, a woman pushes another woman, a woman in a black shirt and a woman in a green shirt. So he's going to index the, the uh, black shirt to his left and a uh, woman in green to the right. And then come the verbs. Remember, now they're at the end, push, be pushed. And finally, you'll see this verb respect at the end. And wh what I love about this example, what the respect sign here, is that even though respect isn't something that moves from one person to another, and nor is telling, here we're going to see the space in the movement of the verb linking it to the nouns. So you can say green tells black that black should show so green, some respect. And you do all that with one word using the space. So black. Green, push, be pushed, respect. <laughs> See? <laughs> okay. 
So we can measure this restructuring in many ways, and here's one. Um, if you plot how frequently points are used in that way that shows who rather than where, you get this pattern. So starting on the left with home signers, who are deaf people who were never exposed to a sign language, and then the first, second, and third cohorts, um, you can see that they all use points to show where about the same amount. That's something that stayed pretty stable. But this nominal use, this use that shows who, that's linking the nouns with the verbs, this use really increased with the, the second and third cohorts of signers. So the question is why this change? And if children are so good at like, learning language, and, and someone's already developed a perfectly good way to mark subjects and objects, you know, why didn't the second cohort just learn to sign it the same way that the first cohort had been doing it? Um, I mean, it's one thing to gradually drop whom from your English, but this is a total restructuring of the language here. So um, to, to answer that question, I think we really need to take seriously this idea of, of language as an organism. Language is an organism. So this isn't just a metaphor when we say this. It's, it's, a language is an abstract thing. It's abstract, but it's, it's still real. It's, a, it's this bundle of structured material, and it, it's self-replicating. And, and we each live in a symbiotic relationship with our language, like the microbes in our gut. Like We can't survive without it, and it can't survive without us. And, and language changes and adapts to the humans that host it. So the social no network of people that, that learn it and pass it on are the environment in which language evolves. Now, the different versions of Nicaraguan sign language that we see signed by different age cohorts today represent this living record of the evolutionary path of the language. And, and so, you know, the way that I've been doing my work that I described is, you know, I look at this slice today, right? If we start with the 1970s in this figure over to the left, and then you have the first cohort coming in, and then in the 80s, the second cohort joins them, and then the third and fourth, you know, that we, can, we can look at today at the differences between the cohorts, but we can't forget that the action, the moment of change is over there, right? It, it's, it's as we add each new wave, and that's where the language, that's when the language reproduces, right? So the first cohort builds the language as children in the 70s, and then they pass it on in the, to this next cohort in the 80s, and, and that second cohort acquires it with some fidelity, but they don't copy it exactly. And, and so on in the 90s and today, and, and we know these changes occurred when they're children, because the path is unidirectional, right? So stuff can get passed on to later cohorts, but not the other way. It doesn't go back. So things that adults initiate or learn, they would be the same for everyone. And there are things like that, right, that, that you see that are the same across all of the cohorts. But these core aspects of the grammar, how the sentence is structured, how you do agreement, how you show who's doing what to whom, those kinds of things, they're, they're, they're changing just in that one direction. And they, they don't get passed on back up. So, um, so this chain from one to two then is where that where got reinterpreted as who. Um, so to take our question about why change it, we have to really think about how languages replicate, right? What's the mechanism that copies that code, the rules and patterns of Nicaraguan sign language, and passes it on to the next iteration of, of NSL, right? Because just because the organism that's, say, 1980s NSL develops some cool characteristic doesn't mean you get to pass it on for free. Um, if we don't have a really good understanding of the mechanism of reproduction, we'll, we'll start to see parallels between development and evolution that don't actually explain the nature of the change. So most of us are more familiar with Lamarck's second law here, um, this idea that adaptations made by an organism in response to its environment get inherited by its offspring, right? So the sons of the blacksmith must have bigger biceps, or the daughter of the giraffe gets a slightly longer neck than her mother started with. Um, but Lamarck also had this first law that um, much as we develop from simple cells to complex systems, that all organisms have a natural drive to complexify. 
And these are great ideas, but they don't work out, right? And they don't work out because now we know that reproduction doesn't work that way. You don't just pass down the useful stuff or the more complex stuff or the, the exercised parts. And, and what we've learned from Darwin and since Darwin is that we have to pay attention to reproduction and selection processes, right? Organisms send along everything. They send out everything, not just the useful stuff, but they do it with variability and noise. So the environment is what's determining what will survive, right? So now we've got, we really have two evolutionary processes on really, really different time scales. So we've got human reproduction and selection on one hand and language reproduction and selection on the other. It's not that one recapitulates the other. It's each of them is evolving and is shaped by the processes of reproduction and selection. In human reproduction, we pass on what kind of patterns we can learn. And it may be very slowly and very long ago that more effective and more powerful pattern learning devices you know, would prevail. But we all came into the world with brains that are product of that process. On the other hand, when languages reproduce, they send out you know, the, all these accumulated symbols and patterns of combinations, but it's a blurry and limited signal, right? It's just the output of someone's own language, and it isn't copied perfectly. And in, in the process of selection, it's not the useful stuff, but the learnable parts of the language that survive. So what we've got then is, is this co-evolution of humans and their languages. Each of them is serving as the environment for the other. And each cannot survive without the other. So the thing is, though, that we don't, we don't set out to, to create languages, to grow languages. right? This isn't done with an intention to make a code. The, humans grow languages because our social connection is so critical. right? When we pass a language from one generation to the next, the goal isn't to to, to create something or you, to organize your message. The, the goal is to connect and the, the drive is a social one. Right? The, the idea is to get your message into someone else's mind and to understand what message someone else is sending to your mind. And in that process of communicating back and forth and actually forth and forth, that's how we weave the fabric of language with the machinery of our minds. So thank you very much.